Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge and welcome to Eldridge and Company. My guest, Stan Altman, is a professor at, at Baruch College. He's been there for the last 22 years and now he's also a professor at City College, at the City College of New York. But almost more importantly to me for today is that he's also a, an innovator and an entrepreneur. And we're I wanna talk about his latest project. I could call it a creation. Um, it's called the Harlem Gallery of Science, and it's a it it's a program with City College, and he's the president of it, and its goal is so admirable and so timely that I think you'll be interested too. So greetings, Stan. Great to see you, you know, buddy. <laughs> it's a long, long introduction, and it doesn't begin to say what you've really done. I guess you, are you the king of interdisciplinary? Disciplinary, interdisciplinary, how you pronounce it, um, projects? I mean, you've done more different partnerships with different schools, right? Yes. I mean, I think um, for me, engaging people across disciplines is very important, uh, particularly in this day and age where I think the problems we confront are so more complicated that just thinking of doing narrow disciplines doesn't work. In fact, my PhD is in systems. So I tend to think that way. Um, I do tend to run projects from my point of view that tend to go across CUNY. Uh, I started one when I was president, the interim president at Baruch with the Rubin Museum of Himalayan Art. The idea was to integrate art throughout the whole Baruch curriculum, whether it was the business school or then the, the Mark School or the School of Arts and Sciences. And that, after two years of pilot testing that, we expanded it to four other CUNY campuses, and today it's CUNY Arts. Such a great thing, because I've always worried about people who specialize in something, and they miss so many other things in the world, you know? Well, I think that's right. And, and this, what I've discovered with the current CUNY students, although I think um, it's probably very typical of many of us who went to various CUNY colleges. Uh, I'm a, graduate of the engineering school at City College, uh, is that we really are very socially minded. That is, we have a sense that we really wanna give back and do something to society. Um, I've been concerned as some of my other colleagues that are working with me on this project about the real lack of um, black and Latinx students who we find entering into the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And in 2014, I started a project with IBM across all of CUNY, which is to have students work on real life problems. And the idea was to use IBM Watson AI technology to kind of solve real problems. And again, over the course of the four programs I've run, over a thousand students participated. And again, a disproportionately underrepresentation of black and Latinx students. Um, so a colleague of mine who also graduated from City College by the name of Brian Schwartz, who was at the Graduate Center, and uh, he was using theater as a way of engaging young people uh, to be interested in physics. He and I um, kind of had this idea about using the idea of interactive exhibitions around very popular themes as a way of attracting young people. And since both of us were concerned about getting more black and Latinx students, we thought the logical place was to do this in Harlem. And if we were gonna to go to Harlem and we clearly wanted to work with a, one of the CUNY campuses, it made sense to be City College. And so out of that effort in 2013, um, we partnered with City College. And uh, for the first year and a half, City College um, it made investments in, in bringing on consultants to take a look at how feasible this idea was. I mean, could you really do something like this in Harlem? Was there a market for it? Um, and then the budget happened. Uh, and as you know, city, the city university has been struggling for the last few years to kind of cover their costs. Understandably, the college decided that they were not gonna continue this program and um, because they just needed to be able to cover the cost of adjuncts and teachers and classes. And my colleague, Brian, and I decided this was just too important, both for the college in the long run. And I think we just felt 
something needed to be done that was really different in terms of addressing underrepresentation of youth of color. And so we decided in 2016 to start a nonprofit. Uh, my wife, Claire, is a lawyer, although she doesn't practice law, and she ended up representing us and getting our nonprofit status. And she didn't um, get paid, so that was good. She doesn't, she doesn't get paid. She is one of the best consultants we have. Uh, actually, it's only topped by, uh, well, I'll tell that story in a minute. But so having started this not-for-profit, we decided to demonstrate what we were talking about. And so we created our first exhibition in 2018 called Dunk, The Science of Basketball. And the idea was kids um, that we were targeting would understand basketball. It was something that was part of their everyday life. And we wove into the exhibition uh, themes about mathematics, physiology. Uh, we engaged them in the idea of hang time. Um, and then we did a second exhibition around the science of music from jazz to hip hop in 2019. Let me just interrupt for a minute. On the board of the organization that you had first formed, um, the Enhancement Engagement Project, right. you also have a basketball player, a former basketball player, a musician, somebody from IBM. I mean, it represents, you put together all these people, right? No, that's right. Uh, I mean, there's a project in Europe called the Science Gallery International, which is really much more targeted to kids who already kind of know they're on their way to college. And from our point of view, we needed to engage the whole community. This is really about empowering young peoples of color. It's perfect with City College because it's in the neighborhood and reaches you know, the kids in Harlem and Upper West and in Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx. So you've got that constituency right there. And those are the, the ones that you're trying to interest in this, right? So no, I mean, the project goes back to kids who aren't yet in college. I no, that's part, exactly right. I assume part of it is to encourage them to go to college. Well, it's partly um, to encourage them to go to college. First, it's really to engage them, to demonstrate that the things that they think they can't do, they're already doing. I mean, I don't think that they fully realize how much technology they're, they're doing just by having a phone. Uh, so interesting to talk about this project in light of President Biden's uh, interest in infrastructure and all the things that he's proposing because that's the open field that we're talking about, right? right. No, I was just gonna say, we were very lucky that uh, uh, I think it was 2017 or 18 um, that Vince Boudreau, who was, then the Dean of the Colin Powell School uh, was made interim president and now he's the permanent president because uh, he has reaffirmed over and over again his commitment to Harlem and Upper Manhattan and the South Bronx in terms of college having a much greater role as a partner. And uh, that's part of the reason I'm up at City College. Is it a, is it a different a population than, than Baruch? Oh yes, there's much uh, greater diversity in terms of students of color. Baruch has a fairly substantial Asian population, partly because of the business school. Uh, so this is a different demographic and it's also a much different uh, set of program offerings. Um, this is one of those campuses within CUNY that really does represent the kind of traditional university setting you would think, even though we're just a college up there. Beautiful campus. I went to high school next door at the High School of Music and Art used to be up right. there. Right. <laughs> it was a great education. Um, so now City College is also building a science center on 126th Street. I mean, it's not a science center. It's a, a STEM. What do you call it? Well, they built, um, when Matt Goldstein was chancellor, they built two major research towers uh, right on the south end of the campus. It must be about 132nd Street. Um, uh, and so that's what's there. On 126th Street, uh, where it used to be the old tasty bread factory, there's a private developer by the name of Janice um, that is putting up a 300,000 square foot uh, science building. And we thought that we were gonna be able to have a permanent home in that building. Um, we negotiated with them through this summer and we finally concluded that the amount of cost to us 
for what they wanted for rent would have been so prohibitive because everything we do is free. That is, we don't charge for any of our exhibitions or performances. I said they couldn't make a contribution to the college? I think we offered them fairly. I mean, it certainly wasn't what they were asking for, but we offered them, I think, a fairly reasonable price. And from their point of view, that wasn't, uh, it wasn't acceptable. But we found an alternative space we're now negotiating with on 125th Street, which is right on the shuttle bus line between the North Campus and City College and where they take people to St. Nicholas and the 8th Avenue subway. So this may work out for the best anyway. That's great. So you and Dr. Schwartz are the, well, you're the president, he's the chairman. Right. And then you've hired a wonderful executive director, uh, Stefan Alexander. Right. That, tell us about him. Well, um, Stefan, you know, there's a whole lot of us who come out of the Bronx, apparently. Stefan grew up in the Northeast Bronx, uh, in Edelweil Housing, where I, th I think one of my f aunts and uncles lived for a long time. He was very much involved in the kind of hip hop scene. He went to Dewood Clinton High School. He met a professor of physics who really engaged him, challenged him. Uh, he went on to get a PhD in physics. Um, he teaches at Brown University. Uh, he actually runs at Brown a program to attract young black students into physics. So he runs a mentoring program. Uh, Stefan was the keynote speaker when we did the, ex the exhibition and performance in 2019 about the science of music, because he's actually weaves in the relationship between music and physics and mathematics. And uh, he was coming into New York to spend a year at the uh, Simons Foundation's Flatiron Research Center. And uh, he was saying, you know, he, he really liked the experience with the gallery. He wanted to get more involved. He was trying to figure out how that could happen. And it was one of those moments I simply said to him, well, Stefan, if that's the case, why don't you become its executive director? And of course, you know, we can't pay you. And he, he agreed. Um, so he became our executive director. Uh, he simultaneously, about a month or two later, became the uh, president of the National Society of Black Physicists. And so we've now teamed up with them uh, and their student membership, which are young black physicists and Latinx physicists, undergraduate and graduate students from all over the country um, to do a mentoring program with middle and high school students with three schools located in Harlem, although the students come from all over. As you know, uh, it's no longer neighborhood schools in the same way when we were growing up. Uh, and so we're running, um, one of the programs we're running is the mentoring program where we have uh, 10 mentors from around the country, from major universities, city, college, and Columbia. We have 10 middle school students, 10 high school students, and we pair a mentor with a middle and high school student. And then the mentors have got their team leaders who are like their coach. And we ran it in the, uh, in the fall. And part of what we do at the beginning of each of the working sessions, we, we hold meetings where everyone gets together once a month. Uh, for both the mentors and the mentees, we have a fellow by the name of uh, Brian Simmons, who is uh, at the high school for food and fashion. And he's become within the Department of Education, the leading proponent of meditation and mindfulness. And so we do a, a simple meditation session at the beginning, focusing on giving the kids the sense that they really have more power over how they react and have a better sense of how to address their own inner feelings at this age. And uh, we did a little video at the end of the fall program uh, the two things that struck me the most, one of the young women who were in the program said, you know, one of the things about this program is I now can get the pressure off my chest, you know, and I can relax. Uh, and, the, and the other young woman said, why should I really doubt my ability to uh, go to college? Why should I doubt my ability to accomplish something? She said, I'm not going to doubt it myself anymore. Uh, and so those are the moments, Ronnie, when you... Uh, you realize all of the stuff you put in uh, really pays off. I mean, we, 
need to raise money to make this work. But those kinds of rewards are really priceless. That's amazing. And that's the kind of thing that makes you know you're doing, you know, almost, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to be corny and I don't really believe it. But anyway, God's work. No, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely right. I think the whole issue, I mean, for me, uh, as you know, my sister, service has been one of the things that drive both of us. Um, the sense that life is more than just earning a buck. It's really more about giving back and somehow helping other people improve their lives. That's how I feel. But why? And I keep thinking, where did we get this? Where did we get this drive? Is it from the times that we, you know, were born into? Because I'm assuming we're almost, assume, you know, in the same decade or something. Uh, the Roosevelt era. Um, mm -hmm. Just the times around us. The, you know, it. What do you think it is? Is it our our religion, even if we're not religious? Well, I think. Um, no, I no, I know exactly what you mean. I think. Uh, it's, it's really hard to know, but I do know that at some point um, growing up and growing up in the South Bronx on the streets of Southern Boulevard and Leggett Avenue wasn't always easy, but there was always the sense that there was something bigger than I was. Um, you know, I used to call it God. Um, sometimes I would refer to it as father, not necessarily my own father, but there was sense that there was something more than just me. And... Um, you know, there were times when I would think that this was all poo-hoo, and then I would realize that something was now missing in my life. So I think there's a piece of interacting with other people, and if you really care about them, you get fairly empathetic about them, in which case, you know, you begin to realize that they have feelings, they have concerns, if you could be helpful. You know, it's this idea of ultimately approaching unconditional love, where you just see people for who they are. You know why we're here. I mean, it's, we, we were part of a community right. and we have to worry about the community and Absolutely. the people in it. Let's go back to the, the so the program. Right. So you're, in, you're, you're working with students, right. not yet in college to encourage- Well, we also them. work with college students because- Oh, I know, yeah. Once they're in college, then you, what, you become what? Well, I'd say there are two ways we're working with the college. One way is when we did the dunk exhibition, um, we needed to have docents so that we had people who could then, because uh, what we did is we reserved blocks of one hour time periods to invite schools to bring classes. So city college students, mostly out of science and out of the engineering school, um, were hired to be docents. And they took the tours around. They explained the exhibitions. They answered questions. Um, and they found it an important way to learn how to speak to lay people. Because most of them don't know how to speak to people. They speak in their own jargon, you know. I discovered as an engineer that sometimes trying to explain to my mother what I was doing, she'd look at me like I didn't speak English. Um, and then the other way we're working with the college is we're very mindful that if we're going to engage all these young people from where they're coming from, then when they get to the college, the college needs to be able to engage them in the programs we're doing. And so we're working with faculty. Uh, we're working on a whole project with uh, the Dean of the Science Division around games. Uh, games are becoming a huge industry in this country and city and across the globe. And many kids, it's amazing how many are into games uh, potentially as future careers. So we have a whole gaming program where we're working on the college side to look at how that would be uh, organized so that students who want to get career paths in science, but leading to gaming as a career in terms of entrepreneurship and startup businesses have a definite track. Gaming has a wide uh, a field, doesn't it? I mean, gaming is part of research or I, I, what I'm thinking about is networks used to program using an army protocol or a Navy with a pro planning, negotiating submarines. Right. <laughs> and so, I mean, gaming has all kinds of applications. Well, it does. Uh, in fact, it's becoming uh, more frequently used uh, in K through 12. I mean, I've used games as a way to create situations that's I mean, my belief is you can't teach some of these things, that you need to experience it. 
So games are used to simulate kind of an environment in which students have to make choices um, and see the consequences in a fairly safe environment. Um, the thing about digital gaming, which is very interesting, is that most of it is done from a fairly white perspective uh, and a very white male perspective. And so as you get students of color involved, they begin to realize that the stories that are told uh, don't reflect their stories. Uh, and in fact, one of the, we're putting together a program we're gonna start in May. And one of the young women who applied to be in this program said, one of the things that really drives her interest in games is because if you look at the way women are portrayed, um, they're portrayed as sex objects. And that's not, you know, that's not how they want to be portrayed. And so they want to change the whole narratives of games. So um, interesting. We're working and we're living in such an era of increased awareness. Right. Isn't it? How it, how it comes up in all different places. Yeah. So what's going to, I know this is a terrible thing to ask you, but what's going to be your next project? Well, um, I think this one is a, this one is a handful. Uh, we are actively, you know, in, in spite of, well, I guess there are two parts of this. In spite of all of the discussions about all this money being invested in communities, low income communities of color and getting more kids into high paying jobs, it's been very hard to raise the money uh, to really have some long term stability in terms of, pro you know, program planning. And we still need to raise money to do a build out on the space. We've got a $1 million commitment from New York State through their Regional Economic Development Council's program. And our chairman and his wife have pledged another million dollars, but we still need to raise probably in total $10 million, five for a capital build out and five to ensure that we have money for the first five years of operation. So I think there's that part. I think the other part of it is um, I've been a long believer and I think the quote may have come from Einstein where ultimately when I start things, uh, there needs to be a point where they don't, they don't need me anymore. That is, they run without me. And just like the case with the Rubin Museum Project in Baruch, where ultimately it got taken over by CUNY, I worked briefly with um, some of the folks up there uh, to have it absorbed. Uh, I think it was Andrea Shapiro Davis who now runs it. Um, so they run it, it's a great program. Uh, I, they don't need me anymore, I'm listed as a faculty member. I think it's the same thing here. I think we're building a prototype at City College, which I personally believe can be replicated at other CUNY campuses. Oh, definitely. Because there's so many that sit in underserved communities that that, and the reason for doing it this way, starting at the middle schools is because everybody keeps talking about these major commitments over 10 years. And as I try to point out to people, if I'm gonna hire someone graduating from college 10 years from today, that student's probably a middle school student. And if I don't start in middle school with these kids, um, then they're not gonna be ready because the, the current structure for their education um, around standardized learning is not where their strengths are. Their strengths are around experiential learning. Uh, it's about engaging real life situations. Um, and it's also about making sure they've got access to resources like other places around the city have. They don't necessarily have all of the supplemental things that many of our middle school kids, uh, middle class kids really get, you know? So I that's like, a long term goal. That's, you definitely. Know. And I, I would like to talk to you to develop a program for the city university in general, that would be supported by the, the businesses, the large corporations, the developers. I mean, why is it such a problem? We are, CUNY is preparing their workforce. These are the people they need. Why are we, is it always looking for more money? It just well, drives me crazy. They can raise the money for political campaigns, right. let them do something that's really useful. No, I think you're right, Ronnie. One of the things we run, we run into all the time, and I've developed a fairly good working relationship with the IBM folks, but it's the same story. When they go to hire people, they go to the Ivy League schools. They go to the Big Ten schools in the Midwest. 
Um, when you talk about going to the publics, the kids are great. You know, that's wonderful social thing, but I don't come to your campus to recruit. Uh, I did a program, I guess in 19, uh, with IBM, it was a national competition. I did it with the Grove School. And the final Sunday, when they did the final presentation, selected winners, we had three senior executives from IBM there. And as Claire and I walked out of the Grove School uh, onto the City College campus with them, they said, wow, this is a beautiful campus. I didn't know that this was even here. He said, well, it's only been here since about 1903. You know, I mean, they said, well, we're always at Columbia, but we guess we've never come this far. All right. And you I'm know just, what? We've come to the end of this program. And uh, I think you need to come back and we need to talk more. I'd be delighted, Ronnie. Perceptions. And thank you so much. And uh, keep doing this. And anything more I can do, I would love to help you. Absolutely. And thanks for having me, Ronnie. Thank you.